This is Grace Notes. I'm Alan Button, and our guests today are John and Darlene Van E. There's a lot that could be said about John and Darlene because they have traveled much and have done a lot in their lives, been a lot of places, involved with a lot of people. And I'll let them tell us their story. Welcome, John. Welcome, Darlene. Thank you. Great to have you here. Speaking of your history, tell us a little bit about, first of all, what your connection with North Carolina is, and then we'll back up. Okay. Our, our daughter and her family lives here in North Carolina, Raleigh. Her husband's Steve Hall, and he works at uh, North Carolina University. North Carolina State University. State University. Steve and Becky, and tell us the names of their kids. They have four girls, Grace, Faith, Hope, and Joy. Uh, and I, they I detect have, a theme there. It looks that way. <laughs> and they have three boys, Daniel, John, and David. Just a few of your grandchildren. Those are just a few. We do have 19, so you know we've got a good share. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's back up. Mm-hmm. Tell us, John, uh, how, with your Dutch background, you ended up in North America. Uh, I was born in the Netherlands and uh, right after the Second World War, 1947. My parents uh, had been in Holland through the occupation, and so that was quite a stressful time for them. The occupation during the, World War II? Yeah, this is the World War II occupation. My oldest uncle was involved in Dutch resistance, but my dad just did errands for them once in a while. He wasn't deeply involved in it. Then when the war was over, they were all kind of concerned, you know, whether Russia would take over all of Europe and some of those things. So they started looking at ways of immigrating. But I think my dad had more of a sort of a free spirit, and the whole country was very restrictive. It was a small country. Everything was regulated very closely. And so he's not that kind of person. So he wanted to find a different place to go. So they uh, got everything ready, sold the farm, and moved to Canada. And at first, it was very hard for them. This was what year? 1952. And you were part of that voyage? I was part of that voyage, crossing the ocean by boat. My mom and dad both got very, very seasick, but I was a young boy and running around the boat and never never noticed it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so got to Saskatchewan. Now, why Canada and not the United States? Uh, it was a matter of sponsorship. At that point, Canada would still have families coming that didn't need a prior sponsor. And in the United States, if you wanted to move to the United States or immigrate to the United States, you needed a sponsor on hand to speak for you before you got there. Whereas in Canada, they, the Canadian government said, okay, if it's appropriate family for immigration, we're willing to accept them and find the sponsor for that family. And that's what they did. And you ended up in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, yeah. Grew up there? Yeah, just outside of Saskatoon. Did your dad continue in farming there? He did some farming, but actually ended up mostly in construction work. The city was expanding in a big way, and so he's working for a company that was building houses. Darlene, you with your Dutch background, how did you end up in the United States? Well, my grandparents immigrated when they were younger, and um, I always consider myself Dutch, but actually I am very American. I think when I was very young, I just had adventure in my blood, and I wanted to go places. And so as it turned out, after I graduated from college, I'm, I'm a teacher by occupation. And you graduated and grew up where? At Northwest Iowa, uh, Orange right. City. Graduated from college? In... From Dort College in uh, Sioux Center, Iowa. And after teaching in Minnesota for a couple of years, I wanted to make a difference in the world, and I wanted to help other people. And so I went to Mexico on a summer program. And while I was in Mexico, someone from the Summer Institute of Linguistics talked to our Which, group. by the way, is Wycliffe, uh, yeah. an- another name for Wycliffe. Wycliffe. Right. And uh, they said they urgently needed teachers for that fall. So I went to talk to him, and so he said, we'd like to have you stay. So I did. And the leader of the group that I was with knew John and said, say, I've got this girl who's going to stay here. Will you take care of her? So uh-huh. Been, been doing, it, doing it ever yes. since. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> So that's how you met in Mexico. That's how we, that's met. How we yeah. met. What took you to Mexico, John? I'd finished college, and I'd been active in my home church up in Saskatoon, and in fact involved in the Leighton Ford campaign. And uh, so that sort of impacted me as the whole matter of evangelism and working you know, for Christ and so. And one of the elders of the church came to me, and he had a little advertisement out of a paper and said, hey, here's a mission program in Mexico. you got to do this. And I didn't have enough excuses to back out of that. He says, okay. Uh, I'll do it, you know. So uh-huh. went down and bought a bus ticket from Saskatchewan to Mexico City. That's four days on the bus. And what year was that? 1968. Yeah. An eventful year 
at mm-hmm. least in the United States. Oh, and that right. was the Olympics year in Mexico City. In Mexico City, yeah. I want to come back to your time in Mexico, but you've identified a song for us that I'm interested in hearing why it's meaningful to you. Horatio Spafford's It Is Well With My Soul. Mm-hmm. Tell us about it. Uh, before I got, uh, one of the things of working in Mexico was uh, I've been teaching at a seminary, and, and part of teaching at a seminary is what you call continuing education. So at one point, I did continuing education in the city of Jerusalem in Israel. And at the school, Jerusalem University College, there's a cemetery, the Protestant Cemetery. And just inside that gate, that's Horatio Spafford's tomb was in there. And so that's how I got to know who Horatio Spafford was. What can you tell us about what you know about why Spafford wrote the song? Spafford was a businessman in, in Chicago and lost a, a lot of things in the Chicago fire. This was in uh, the 1870s? 1870s or so, uh-huh. yeah. And then um, he had decided that he would close his business and, and send his family on to Europe, which he did. But some of the business things that held him back in Chicago, and so he sent his, his wife and four children on, on the ship. And as the ship was crossing the Atlantic, it had an accident and sunk. The daughters were all killed in the sinking of the ship. His wife made it and uh, telegrammed him back and said, you know, all lost, one saved. And that was her. Uh, Later on, uh, they got together, and then he did travel across the Atlantic again in another ship. And as they were crossing the Atlantic, uh, somebody on the ship said, hey, this is close to where that previous ship went down. And uh, he went to his cabin and wrote this song, apparently. Uh, It is well with my soul. You know, when sorrows were like sea billows roll. I mean, sorrows were in his life. Things didn't go as well as he expected. He had trials and troubles and so forth. In the middle of this, he knew that the Lord was with him. It is well with my soul. Why? Because the Lord is with me. And even though there's a lot of trouble, the Lord's with me. Obviously something with substantial application to all of us. Yeah. Well, let's hear the song, It Is Well With My, my soul. soul, by Horatio Spafford. Mm-hmm. That was It Is Well With My Soul, written by Horatio Spafford, performed by Chris Rice. Beautiful version of that hymn. If you're just joining us, our guests today are John and Darlene Van E. Darlene, let me uh, shift gears a little bit to you and uh, have you tell us something about your time in Mexico. The two of you have been in Mexico for more than 40 years now? That's right. I guess even though I had a sense of adventure from a very young age on, I think the verse that really helped me was, with my God I can scale a wall from Psalms. And so I think of that many times when we get to difficult places, you know, I can't do this by myself. Of course I can't. It's been a challenge living in Mexico. We would often run out of water. Um, Raising children in Mexico, it had its challenges, but it was really good. For one thing, we were different from anybody else. We were white. At home, we spoke English. And so the kids learned from an early age on, we don't do some things that other people do just because we don't. Um, The Mexican culture is very rich. So I think our children have a very rich heritage, having gone to Mexican school, and um, then they were homeschooled, and living within the Mayan community and being a part of it. When they went to Mexican school, there were about a 1,000 kids in the school from kindergarten through grade 12, and besides our children, there were two other white children in school. And our kids didn't think of themselves as, as Americans. They were part of this school, and it was really good. Mexico has been big in the news lately here in the United States. And of course, in North Carolina, there are significant subsidiary issues related to immigration and NAFTA. I'd be interested in your thoughts on those matters, given your experience in Mexico. When I first got to Mexico, uh, NAFTA wasn't in place. It was a country that lived very much by itself. It was not integrated into a world economy. The cars, the TV sets, everything was manufactured locally, sold at a very high price. 
and it was very difficult for us to import anything at all. And I'd say the commerce level of the, of the country was very low and many places still very, very poor. NAFTA, of course, changed that a lot, North American Free Trade Agreement, and it opened the commercial side of the country. And uh, a lot of factories were built and, uh, you know, inbound plants and so forth. And the whole matter of being able to buy a decent TV set at the local <laughs> Sam's Club. Before NAFTA, there weren't any Sam's Clubs in, in Mexico. There wasn't any Costco. There weren't any of these large retailers there. It was just smaller stuff. And with the NAFTA, the large retailers set up their shop and... Uh, it used to be for us, we'd go once or twice to the border just to buy things we couldn't buy in Mexico. But the first time I walked into the Sam's Club in Merida, when that thing opened, we looked at it and says, oh boy, we don't have to do our trips to Texas anymore for, <laughs> for buying things we can't buy in Mexico uh-huh. because everything was available there. And so it opened up things you know, in a big way. And I, I personally, I think NAFTA has been very, very good for Mexico. And personally, I think NAFTA is very good for the United States as well because where we live, the soil is very poor. Uh, Yucatan has to import all, almost all of its foodstuffs, and it imports it from the United States. So it's, uh, it isn't just a, a one-way street in terms of work or, or products. Darlene, I think you were saying before we came into the studio something about the workers' circumstances in Mexico. Right. Mexicans are very hard-working people, generally very honest, and they're, uh, they're just nice people. And by the way, the people who come here People who are immigrants, like my husband, they're the toughest lot. They are the most daring. They're hardworking. And if you aren't, you're not going to make that move. So immigrants are good people and work hard. In Mexico, we find that the Mexicans take advantage of their own people. If they can get something for less, if you can hire something done and, and kind of cheat on on the way you pay them or the way you count their hours, you kind of figure, well, there are lots more Mexicans there. There are lots more people, so it doesn't matter so much how we treat them. And so when people can work for an American company, they are treated better. Their salary may not be the same wage that you would get in the States, but they are treated fairly, and uh, their time counts, and they are given vacation days. Our friends and neighbors and people who we work with They work a minimum of 12 hours a day. They may have to work seven days a week, and they do it because if they don't, they'll lose their job. There's a lot more that we could say, of course, uh, about the challenges, the pros and the cons uh, of our international relationships. I'll make an effort at some kind of segue here, speaking of things NAFTA-related, and your being from Canada, John. We've identified together another song that has a Canadian connection, sung by Anne Murray, Just a Closer Walk With Thee. Tell us about it. It's a song that relates very closely to when you go through life, when you're walking through life, and times of trial and trouble. It's a time in which we can walk closer with Christ, and Christ walks closer with with us as well. And as we go through life, the whole matter of living it and walking with Christ becomes more important. When trials and troubles happen, that's our consolation. That's uh, He's the one who stands with us. He's, he's the pastor. He's the one that holds us, holds our hand. And so that song communicates it in you know, a very, very beautiful way. Let's hear it. Just a Closer Walk With Thee by Ann Murray, one of our regular Timeless Favorites artists. That was Just a Closer Walk With Thee by Ann Murray. If you're just joining us, our guests today are John and Darlene Van E. John, I know that you have spent low these 40 and more years teaching at a seminary in Mexico, and I understand one of your specialties is Hebrew. Biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, how you got into that. When I was first in Mexico and when we first met and married, uh, I had been there as a lay missionary. And so I actually had only limited Bible school education at that point. In about 1975, we decided, well, I'm going to do seminary. So we did seminary in the United States in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And so at the seminary, the biblical languages were required, uh, Greek and Hebrew. And for whatever reason, I think it's my personality or my 
mindset or whatever, I did much, much better in Hebrew than I did in Greek. Uh-huh. <laughs> Greek was a super struggle for me, and Hebrew was a joy. I mean, <laughs> whoa. And when I got back to Mexico in 1980, uh, a friend of mine started San Pablo Seminary. And he had an extension center that he was expanding into a full seminary. And says, hey, you need some help. Okay. He was doing the Greek. He says, but he said to me, ah, I don't really like Hebrew. I says, well, guess what? <laughs> I like Hebrew. Uh-huh. So I started with Hebrew there. And it was a little bit hard at first because textbooks are very limited. We found a textbook that had been written in Puerto Rico and used that. But eventually we got into the groove of it. And now it's uh, somewhat easier or simpler now because a lot of computer programs that do a lot of the work for you. So between the two of you, you and your friend, you had the biblical languages covered there at the covered, seminary. Yes, we did. With your experience, the experience of the two of you in things international, you no doubt have some thoughts, uh, some insight on what it takes to live in a pluralistic society like ours. I'd be interested in hearing any comments you'd care to make about that. When you're living in a pluralistic society or you're living with people with great cultural differences in their, in their background and so forth, you really learn to accept the good values of other people's cultures. I get to Mexico and there are sometimes I just simply just take my watch off because it really doesn't matter anymore. You know? mm. <laughs> in the United States, time is very rigid. If you say 10 o'clock, you're going to be there at 10 o'clock. Whereas in Mexico, you say, you're going to be there at 10 o'clock. If the person arrives by 11 o'clock, you go, yes, we're inside the hour of 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. You know? So it's your definition of time. Instead of letting it bother you or, you know, grate on your nerves and so forth, you become, you get to appreciate it. And so every culture has its good sides and its not so good sides. And, and you learn to appreciate the good things in other people's culture. And in some cases, adapt them as well. Darlene, on that point, do you make efforts or think about changing things in other people's lives or persuading them in certain directions? Well, in our own personal family, our kids uh, sometimes didn't know where they came from when it depends who asks you. Um, If a Mexican asks where you're from, it means where you were born. It may mean where you came from at one time. So they didn't always know if they were from Canada or the United States or if they were from the Yucatan or, or where. So we said it doesn't matter where you're from as long as you know where you're going. And I think that has been a theme in, in our lives. For people who may be struggling in whatever situation in their lives, if they know where they're going and you don't have to be like everyone else, for teenagers especially, well, for grown-ups too, you kind of like to fit in. You like to do what other people are doing. You kind of like to look like other people. You don't like to look like you're really old-fashioned. You want to fit in, sort of. But if you know who guards your life, if you know what goals you have in life, then you are going to be safe. Um, I know I've had uh, experience with a broad range of, of what you would call social agencies. Uh, many of them do a, a terrific job, you know, helping everybody. But uh, one thing about when you're helping people, if the people don't change their own lifestyle with the help, in other words, improve on how they're doing things and what they're doing, then the help just sort of, you know, disappears, it just evaporates. <laughs> Whereas if there is a life change in how they're going to do things, their, their work ethic or their things that they're doing, then the help is, is much more effective. In other words, it isn't just helping somebody, it's also helping somebody to restructure their life in such a way that they will have a better life after that as well. And isn't it true that relationships are really important in making that happen? That mm-hmm. just providing money and leaving, that doesn't do the job. It's the yeah. human relationships that are ongoing that make the difference. Very true. Yeah, very true. The two of you have been careful and thoughtful about selecting the music that we're playing today. And this third song that you've identified, The Lord Bless You and Keep You, tell us why that's special to you. Well, it's just very special because uh, we need God's blessing. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. We have seen that in our lives in in so many ways. And sometimes I just can't comprehend how much God has blessed us. We have done things that are out of the norm, that are outside of the circle, and God has blessed us probably because of that. And um, I think he has smiled on us a lot. I'm very grateful. John? 
Uh, what she wasn't saying is that our background is a Christian Reformed Church, and the Christian Reformed Church ministry does a sign-off on their Back to God Hour programs with this particular song, The Lord Bless You and Keep You. One of the reasons I chose it is that when I was teaching Hebrew in the last semester, uh, the students asked me to do the closing in Hebrew, and I couldn't quite pull it off, so I had to <laughs> memorize it in Hebrew. Yibarecha Adonai ve'yeshemarecha. So this is a victory song for you. It's a victory song. <laughs> Incidentally, that was found in one of the uh, archaeological digs, the original. So it's the oldest existent piece of scripture from the Bible. Uh-huh. Uh, it was found on a pair of silver scrolls in, in Jerusalem. I wasn't involved with finding this particular piece, but I was in, worked in the same uh, dig a few years later. And so it's sort of a special... In Israel. In Israel, yeah. Uh-huh. Darlene and John, it's been a real treat to have you here today. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. Thank you. Mil gracias. Lo apreciamos mucho. Gracias. Gracias. We wish you well in your continued travels for you and your family. Thank you. Toda <laughs> roba. Translate. Thank you very much. That's Hebrew. Let's hear the song. The Lord bless you and keep you. And we're going to hear the version by the York College Concert Choir. You've been listening to Grace Notes, a special program here on Life 103.1 featuring people who may be relatively unknown, but who meet life's challenges in ways that brighten the lives of those around them. Our producer is Christina Dolan. I'm Alan Button, and we invite you to join all of us here at the station again next Friday at 530 for Grace Notes on Life 103.1.